Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm trusting that you had an amazing day and uh, so nice having you with us again online with our Bible study and communion. So uh, before we get into the word, let's uh, you can click on the link of uh, the song that I chose for tonight. And then if you'd like to, you can open up or get your Bibles ready in Colossians 3. That's uh, some of my scriptures that I would be reading for, from. So, uh, yeah, let's get into some praise and worship. And then uh, we'll get into the word. Amen. Enjoy. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So tonight I'd like to just uh, share my thoughts a little bit. And um, my title for tonight's message is called Holy Living. You know, I felt a few uh, weeks ago it's time for an upgrade. You know, when you are in the body of Christ, when you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we never want to get stagnant. We always want to go higher and higher. And listen to what Colossians 3 verses 1 says. It says, and I'm reading out of the NLT, and it says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, I'm saying it again, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor, at God's right hand. And think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. So Jesus is, or Paul is saying to you, listen, you need to get your mindset ready. You need to raise your level. You need to raise your standards um, because there's something, something more better, something more pure, something more honest, something more exciting for you that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you and through you. And uh, how amazing is it that we can dwell in the word? So I'd like to read further out of Colossians 3, verse 3, and it says, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. You know, since believers have died to sin in the sense of being separated from sin, our lives as believers are now hidden in Christ. Or you can even say it's contained in Christ. And I love how Isaiah 26, verse 2 puts it, and it says, We have a strong city and God makes salvation its walls. So not only are we hidden and contained, but we are also protected because of our salvation of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. So Christ is described as the one in whom all hidden are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge as well. You know, when Christ died for us, when we put our trusting faith in him, we died to sin also. It's a conscious decision that we make to to follow Christ and stop doing all the nonsense and stupid things we've done in the past. And it says here, and we are set free from its power. You see, those who die to the world and to sin with Christ will also live with Christ into eternity. And isn't that what our salvation and living for Christ is, is having that eternity-minded mindset of us. So let's move a little bit further down to Colossians 3, verses 12, and it says there, Since God chose you to be holy, to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So what I love about this scripture is in both Colossians 3, verse 5 and 8, Paul listed five ways of Life Christians are to avoid, and you're welcome to read the whole Colossians at your own time. But in this verse, he offers five ways of life Christians ought to follow. And in addition, he addresses the believers using three names. Listen to this. So firstly, it says, you are God's chosen one. So God selected or elected us to be part of his family. The next one, is says, These believers are holy, which means that you and I have been set apart. And this is due to Christ's work in us and nothing out of our own good deeds. And then thirdly, he says, believers are beloved by God. How amazing is it that we are beloved by God and nothing can separate us from from his love. So the first positive practice Paul gives is a compassionate heart. And this is a response from us to God and to others, which is filled with love and concern rather than any selfishness. The second thing Paul mentions is kindness. So the Greek word for this is, and listen to this, 
Christotisha, which can also be translated as moral goodness or the other word that you might recognize is integrity. The term refers to how a person treats treat each other. And thirdly, believers are to live in humility, and that's a trait valued by God throughout Scripture. In James 4 verse 6, it says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So the, the gospel requires people to admit that we all are still sinners and we are in need of a savior. And as believers, we should recognize God's supremacy in our lives and how limited we are in comparison. But humility is also important that we don't act arrogantly or unfairly towards other people. The fourth thing Paul mentions is meekness. And from the Greek, prauteta, this is not an attitude of fear or the suggestion that Christians ought to be timid. Rather, it refers to gentleness instead of a hard-hearted response to others. You see, a meek person is one who controls their strength and power rather than abusing it. And then the fifth one, it says, Paul expects patience from believers. And this is one of the other traits that's very closely related to Galatians, to the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. If we move on to Colossians 3, verse 13, and I chose specifically chose the NLT version because I've missed this every time, and it, and it starts and it says, make allowance for each other's faults. Isn't that amazing? Other trans- translations would say, bear with others' faults. But it says here, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive. You know, bearing with one another, believers are, you know, we are family. And we should treat each other with kindness and grace. And this includes also forgiveness as well as tolerance. So instead of demanding perfection in others, we need to be willing to endure other believers. And here's the thing, and when they fall, we need to be ready to forgive and help them to heal. You know, it's so amazing because Jesus forgave all our sins with no room for any wrath or vengeance. And we should act the same. <clears throat> if we move to Colossians 3 verse 14, it says, Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. So Paul called love the more excellent way. And even in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 31 and 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says love is the supreme attribute. Love supersedes all other attitudes. You know, from Paul's perspective, love brings people together and makes the differences compatible. You know, what? It, I just went and Googled what is harmony, and it means the positive combination of things which are not exactly the same. Can I say it again? Harmony means the positive combination of things which are not exactly the same. So I'd like to use, you know, a band as an example. Each and every person plays a different instrument, but all together makes it a perfect sound and perfect harmony, and it all works together. You know, one thing we as believers have been given many spiritual gifts, but the greatest one of these is love that we can share with each other. 1 Peter 4 verse 8 adds, and, and it says, Keep above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. When we move to Colossians 3 verse 15, it says, And let the peace, peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace, and always be thankful. So in verses 12 through 14, Paul has given eight positive traits for us, which Christians are to emulate. And here he adds another two for believers to pursue. So firstly, he calls believers to live in peace. Again, part of the fruits of the Spirit. And, you know, when we receive peace with God through the blood of the cross, it is to rule in our hearts, meaning that it should be in charge from from now on. And that's how we suppose to live. It is important for us 
to remember the context of this statement also, because Paul is not referring to peace in the sense of happy feelings. In prior verses, he was discussing the needs for Christians to tolerate love and support each other. But in this verse, after mentioning peace, Paul actually speaks of unity the Christians must have. With Christ as the head, we are all part of a spiritual body, which is the church. This peace that he talks about is called, or you should know it as the shalom peace, the wholeness, a completeness, lacking nothing. This is a peace within the body that we require from every part of the body. Every group of believers will experience eventually some way or another internal conflict, but seeking peace will help us resolve issues in the context of our Christian life. And the second trait Paul mentions in this verse is an attitude of thanksgiving. Paul mentions thanks multiple times in this letter in Colossians, showing the importance of the gratitude in our Christian life. Then Colossians 3 verse 16, it says, Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. So Paul described 10 positive behaviors already for us that we need to practice. But the, the, the 11th trait is to dwell to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know, this verse lists three specific applications of Christ's word dwelling in us as a believer. The first two aspects he speaks about is about teaching and admonition. You know, Christ's word can instruct us with uh, its teaching, and at the same time, Christ's word can also show us where we are wrong. So the word of Christ give us guidance in how to correct mistakes in what we believe and what we do. And then thirdly, is singing our various types of spiritual songs with an attitude of thanksgiving. You know, singing praise to God is largely associated with showing our gratitude to him rather than focusing on ourselves and on our own desires. And then my last scripture for tonight is Colossians 3 verse 17. And it says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to the God, to God the Father. You know, so Paul is saying and teaching us the all-encompassing phrase that whatever you do. (laughs) So anything that's unmentioned in this list is to be understood from this word in this verse, and this includes what we say and how we act. So our relationship with Christ is not about a set of rules, but we are to submit to him in whatever we think or do. You know, we are to do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. And the final phrase goes, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we thank God the Father in the name of Jesus, and it's through Jesus We are saved and have everlasting life. So tonight, as we're going to partake of the communion, the Lord just placed a scripture on my heart, and uh, it's in Matthew 26, 39, and it says, well, after Jesus and the disciples had their last supper, it says, Jesus went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet... I want your will to be done, not mine. You know, this is an amazing confidence that we have in Christ Jesus, that he has set the really a perfect example for us of living holy. You know, in the moment where he was at his lowest, at his most vulnerable, he said, Lord, it's not about me still. It's about your will for my life. You know, God's will is still better than yours. And there will be a great outcome not only for today, for tomorrow, but for generations and ever after. There will be a great godly outcome over your life as well when we start to put God first, our desires and our selfishness one side. So tonight, as we're going to partake of the communion, I don't know what's laying on your heart and what you'd like to bring before God. So let's just take this moment, just a few seconds, and say, Lord, I really need you in this area of my life. 
But I thank you because of the body of Christ that I can come before you with boldness and confidence. And Lord, I'm trusting for that breakthrough because I've been made healed. I've been healed and made whole. I'm trusting you for that victory in my life. I'm trusting you for that breakthrough. I thank you, Lord, that whatever constraints I have in my life, whatever financially I'm battling or suffering, Lord Father, I see that breakthrough because, Lord, I'm not bringing this before man, but I'm bringing it before the Lord my Father. So as we partake of the bread, Jesus, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it into pieces, gave it to his disciples saying, "This, take this and eat for this is my body. Thank you, Jesus. As we partake of the blood, in Matthew 26, 27, and he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom as we partake of the wine that represents the blood of Christ. Lord, we thank you that our sins have been washed clean, that by the blood of Christ we are protected, that we are made whole, and that we can serve you and know that whenever we pray, we are in right standing with Lord the Father through our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, the blood of Christ. Lord, I thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you that we can surrender everything. And Lord, as we achieve and strive to live a holy life before you, Lord Father, let your Holy Spirit guide and lead us and show us the way forward. Lord, I thank you that our sins are forgiven, that we can walk boldly and confidently into the loving arms of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hope to see you on Sunday. Have a blessed evening. God bless you. Amen.